Now for today's program. Today's Zoominar is part of the Wide River Project, an initiative that takes a deep dive and fresh look into the art history and issues that both unite and divide the Black and Jewish communities. Dr. Rochelle L. Ford, president of Dillard University in New Orleans, has earned a stellar reputation as a hands-on transformative leader. Dr. Ford chairs the Greater New Orleans Higher Education Consortium and sits on the boards of many organizations. Her scholarship and experience include diversity, equity, and inclusion, public relations, advertising, journalism, and media. President Ford earned her bachelor's degree from Howard University, her master's degree from the University of Maryland College Park, and her PhD from Southern Illinois University in Carbondale. She also earned a graduate certificate in higher education administration from Harvard University and was the first Clark Atlanta University HBCU Executive Leadership Institute graduate to become a college president. Joining Dr. Ford today is Nadine Epstein. Nadine is an award-winning journalist and author. She has been the editor-in-chief and CEO of Moment Magazine since 2004 and is the founder and executive director of the Center for Creative Change. Nadine is the author of RBG's Brave and Brilliant Women, 33 Jewish Women to Inspire Everyone, which she wrote in collaboration with the late Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Please welcome Dr. Rochelle L. Ford and Nadine Epstein. Thank you, Suzanne. And Dr. Ford, it's so great to have you here with us today to celebrate the memory of Dr. King and the principles and the strategies that he stood for and he died for. So um, just thank you for being here. There's such a long history of Blacks and Jews working together in the United States for a just society. And it's a really complex history, one we all really need to learn about and understand because that alliance between American Blacks and American Jews is really one of the building blocks of, of our democracy. And um, I just thought maybe we could start with a brief, you give us like a little background about some of the history of how Blacks and Jews, you know, have, have been allies um, since the beginning of the 20th century. Sure, so thank you so, first of all for inviting me to participate in this program. And um, I'm excited to be in, I'm working in collaboration with you and with others to really, to help end hate, right? Bottom line. And I think that's really where the story begins, is that unfortunately, America's history, um, beginning with the enslavement of, of Black people, um, created a, a foundation, a country where hate became the norm. And we like to do things that would tear people apart and instead of working collaboratively, would separate and to try to destroy people. And as... Um, Jewish people migrated to United States as well, and people realized that they were different. How do you retain power? Well, you you hate them. So you have anti-Semitism beginning early in, in the United States history as well, and blocking Jewish people for being able to realize oftentimes their full potential. Um, and we have to recognize that there is power in us working collaboratively to end hate, whether it's in the form of racism or in the form of anti-Semitism? And how do we lean into love and how do we lean into understanding? And it's important, just a, a couple of things that I, I tend to highlight, and it's not a perfect history because there is actually a history of, of Jewish people enslaving Black people in America. So it's not a perfect history. But some of the things that we like to point to as examples of our ability to work together is even you think back to times even in in, in the war war um in two when is when the darkest ages of um his parts of the world history with the holocaust it were african american service members who didn't have freedom in the United States yet and still were fighting in World War II and were helping to liberate the concentration camps in Europe. Um, at the same time, when you come to the 1950s and 60s and you're looking at the civil rights movement, you have um, a lot of the freedom riders, the youth, who are a lot of um, Jewish youth who participate in the freedom rise in the South and like, let's break these segregation rules to help desegregate 
um, America, you had Rabbi Heschel, um, Heschel, who was a four leader um, in Jewish American thought, but not everybody thought that that was a wise decision for him to stand side by side with Dr. Martin Luther King to advocate for and march for um, the civil rights of all Americans. It's a complicated history, but it's an important history to recognize that there's a lot more that we can do together to advance um, America to be the democracy that we want it to be, to be that great experiment where we can have justice for all. And, and that's one of the main reasons why we felt so strongly at Dillard that as we lean into our mission of cultivating leaders, who live ethically, who think and communicate precisely, who act courageously to make the world a better place, that we were called to restart this dialogue at a national level that um, to help to have greater understanding of our shared positive past and how we move towards making the world better today together. We're gonna get there in a minute because it's really important. We're gonna be talking about the center that you've relaunched, but I just want to actually one of the things really interesting parts of history of this relationship too is how HBCUs, historic black colleges and universities, took in American Jewish refugees from professors and intellectuals from mm -hmm. Europe, which ended up saving their lives when they were actually many, many other universities wouldn't accept them. So they weren't able to come into the United States. So that's really, you know, I've always been fascinated by that. So um and I, and I always Think a lot about how this impacted HBCUs and the generation that was in school then um, sure. as well. One of the misnomers I think people oftentimes have about historically Black colleges and universities as if they were designed only and exclusively for Black people. The mm -hmm. history of historically Black colleges and universities that we've always been open to any student who wanted to come and to learn. We make it a, a point of pride that our doors are open. And so our doors have been open to Jewish Americans to both be scholars, as mm -hmm. well as to be students, as well as to be active in the community and partnership. And it's a, it's an important thing to recognize that the world historical means that it, yes, we historically, we were founded to educate Black people after um, the Civil War, as we were newly emancip emancipated people, although there were free Black people even here in New Orleans before the Civil War. But it's important to note that when our doors open, it was open, they were open as an inclusive place. And in fact, our own history of, of Dillard University, which I, I love to share also, is that during the Great Depression, when our predecessor universities were about to close, because you know so many universities and institutions were closing, um, the presidents met with um, the Stern family, which is um, part of the Rosenwald um, family as well, um, and said, let's create a new institution that will allow um, this historically Black college to survive. And so the support of working together um, is a big part of our own history here at Dillard. Yes, and apparently you have like some of your buildings are named for Rosenwalds and Stearns and- um... Here for Hartzell. <laughs> Even our iconic Avenue of the Oaks is named after uh, Ms. Keller who helped to desegregate um, libraries and things here in New Orleans as well. That's really cool. Really. Well, so I was reading a little bit about Dr. Uh, Dr. Cook, Samuel mm -hmm. Du Bois Cook, mm -hmm. who actually was the original founder of the Center for Black Jewish Relations at Dillard in 1989. Mm -hmm. And um, I actually noticed that, of course, one of his inspirations is that he, he actually had a refugee professor, Jewish mm -hmm. refugee professor, who he who came up to talk to him and said, well, I'm also a minority. And that this got him thinking and I was wondering if you just tell us a little bit about the founding of this center originally and why Absolutely. Dr. started it. So, you know, Dr. Cook was an amazing um, scholar. He, um, like Dr. Martin Luther King, started um, college as a teenager and was classmates at Morehouse College with um, Dr. King. And a lot of people may not know that fact. And then he went on to graduate school at The Ohio State University, where he did uh, meet 
um, a professor who was like, I'm a minority like you. And he was like, wait, what? <laughs> and they started to tell the story. And, and even if you look at the narratives, particularly of the African-American church and experience, although, you know, Christians believe in the Old Testament and the New Testament, but if you listen to a lot of the preaching and words of the Old Testament, the relationship to the freeing of, of Moses and the, the Israelite slaves and those narratives of hope and even lamentations and things that come from that have brought so much hope to the African-American experience because of that, that arc of freedom, that story of freedom, that story of survival and, and overcoming obstacles and having hope. Um, is commonalities even in that 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 faith tradition between um, particularly the African American Christian Church and that of Jewish people, and you'll hear that in the songs and things. But with Dr. Cook in particular, he also um, helped to desegregate faculty in the South. He was the first tenured professor at a predominantly white institution in the American South. He became tenured at Duke University. And in fact, Duke University has a center name for Dr. Cook that advocates for social justice um, to this day. And so he worked there during the civil rights time, was there when Dr. King was killed and represented um, Duke at the funeral um, of his dear friend, um, and then came back and was in community with with the students at Duke as they were mourning the loss of Dr. King and helping to move that forward. And if there's a wonderful um, memoir called um, Roses for the Soul. And so this is a memoir that um, his um, students, both at Duke and at Dillard, wrote to honor him and for the lessons that were learned. And he recognized from the civil rights movement being close to his own faculty member about the value of us working together. And much like what we found ourselves in the 2020s, in the 1980s, he was seeing the same sort of pitting Black people against Jewish people, forgetting that shared history and he said, I need to do something. And he's like, let's establish this National Center for Black Jewish Relations. And in fact, the they held conferences between 1989 and 1997 when he was president has produced this book, The Black Jewish Relations, and it is a copy of many of the conference papers. And so this is it's out of print. And so we're working on right now trying to get it reprinted. Um, the publisher is actually out of print. But one of the things the center wants to do in partnership with the, the center at Duke is to make sure we get this republished so that we can get it into the hands to have that, that history um, remembered. And he also, not only did he establish the center, but he went on to become um, one of the, um, one of the board members for the Holocaust Memorial. Um, and he continued this work to advocate for ending hate and how do we move forward justice in America um, with Blacks and American Blacks and American Jews working collectively. Wow, what an amazing man. Um, so you became president of Dillard in 2022. Mm -hmm. And one of the first things you talked about was one of your priorities was to relaunch the center. And I was wondering, you know, what, why did you decide, why, what, what motivated you to make this a priority? Sure. In 2022, the same sort of things that Dr. Cook was experiencing, I think we were we were experiencing that. Whereas there were, you know, during the, the Black Lives Matter, there definitely were some Jewish people who were standing um, in solidarity with African-Americans who were crying out like, you know, Black Lives Matter, right? At the same time, there were many that were not and wondering why can't Black people get it together, <laughs> Right. Um, and then you fast forward to 2022, the some of the, the rhetoric that we're hearing in music and that athletes were saying, et cetera, there were some anti-Semitic things that were being said um, and uh, causing additional confusion. And for again, remember when we started, how do we pit people against each other instead of working collaboratively to end hate and advocate for peace? And so I felt, and as I learned the history of Dillard and about um, the Jewish community working side by side 
with the African American community to um, establish Dillard out of Strait in New Orleans universities, I said, this is a piece of history that we need to, to restore and make sure that my students not only know the history of Dillard, but also how do we galvanize and really create a space for dialogue? How do we create a space for learning? How do we create space for mutual understanding between Black and Jewish communities? And so it was perfect sense that let's not recreate a wheel, let's bring that wheel back out and say, hey, let's use this as a vehicle for us to move America forward. How do we make this world a better place? Well, I actually have a quick question. Why did it close to begin with? And when well, did it close? Sure. It started to close in um, 2000, excuse me, 1997, as Dr. Cook was leaving a new president coming in with a different set of priorities and objectives. Then something called Hurricane Katrina hit. And when Hurricane Katrina hit, the university went into survival mode. And so at that point, it was about rebuilding and restoring Dillard to exist for the future. And so one of the things that I love about my my two immediate past um, presidents of Dillard, Marvelyn Hughes, the first African-American woman, she's like, we're going to save this university. And she did. She survived and we reopened the doors of Dillard. And then Dr. Walter Pingbo came back and how do we continue to elevate our presence? How do we recruit more students? And also, how do we get loans forgiven <laughs> for the for the amount of debt that it, it costs to rebuild the campus? Um and they were able to ensure that the university existed. So when I began, it was a very different time and necessity of what the university, what we were facing. And so how do we really lean into Dillard being what we're calling a community? How do we work directly with the community to live our mission of cultivating leaders who live ethically, think and communicate precisely and act courageously to make the world a better place? And so understanding the history, understanding our vision of being a community, it made sense that we could best advance healthy, safe and innovative communities by reestablishing this center, connecting our past to the current needs. And that's what we saw in 2022. And so when we had our first MLK day, we said it's time to relaunch the center. And that's what we did. So what have you accomplished so far with the center and what are you hoping to accomplish? Sure. So one of the first things that we did um, as our launch event is we had um, a film that really looked at um, uh, the the shared history, the shared stories between the Black um, and Jewish communities, particularly in the civil rights movement. And then we formed a national advisory committee and we're continuing to develop out who serves on that. But it is a national um it is a national board um, that is helping us to do that. So Sherry Rogers, who's president of Spill the Honey, um, she's the one that um, produced that documentary. And we're working with her to make sure that that gets distributed out into the hands of others, um, particularly in higher ed and other communities. Um, we have an advisor from the Israeli Minister of, of Foreign Affairs who also works um, with um, Philios um, Black, which brings African-Americans over to um, study and explore and learn about Israel. So our advisory board also includes um, members of Halal. Um, we have folks from um, from other organizations, including um, Brandeis University. So they have been added in uh, with their special advisor to the president, and she's in charge of the initiative for the um, um, to counter anti-Semitism in America. So we're building out this coalition and also it's important that we're building out the coalition with respect to recognize the diversity in, within African-American communities. And so we're excited that um, Dr. Abdullah um, Antipali, who is the assistant vice president and provost at Duke University and is a leading scholar of Muslim and Jewish relations has joined the board. And so I mentioned this because African-Americans are Muslim. They're also Jewish, which a lot of people forget that there are Black American Jews. And in fact, one of our alums, Nathan Looney, is the leader of multicultural affairs for the Federation, the National Federation, um, Jewish Federation. 
and he's a dealer to love. But so we have, we want to make sure that people understand the breadth of what being Black in America is. So the first thing was beginning to grow our board. The second thing is, is starting with programs where we are having what we're calling a beloved series, where we bring people together to have a meal, to talk across difference. And then the next day we either have a panel or we have a film discussion. And so we held, um, there's two films that we're showing um, this academic year. The first film we did was looking at the Tree of Life's and, um, uh, mass shooting that happened at the synagogue in Pittsburgh and having a discussion about that. And then we're having Temple Emanuel um, or having the um, uh, showing the film of that and having a discussion about that. But we're also launching a series that is looking at that shared history of the Muslim, Jewish, and African-American faith called Father Abraham and exploring, um, exploring that as well. But we're doing it, one of the reasons why I mentioned food is it creates dialogue. We had a, a, a soul food Shabbat, we called it, and we um, had, um, we, we ate a, a meal together um, and we talked about what does it mean? What are those stories? What does, what is the story that is, is understood? Um, and so what we're trying to do is to take, not recreate wheels, but amplify programs that are working at other schools, other universities, bring in other trainings, um, so that we can expand that. But we are literally in year one. We're in so year one. You're working in the university and in the city of New Orleans, but also you have a national focus as well, it sounds like. Absolutely. And so we're building out that national board, and then we'll be building out what programs and how we can use the networks in which we're in to bring people together and to share the word. So... October 7th. Yes. Uh, and um, I know, the, how has that impacted your work, really? I mean, it's such a blow to so many things, <laughs> to the world order. <laughs> um, but how has this impacted your work at the center? So it refortified why there's a need for the center. Mm -hmm. um, and simply put, it's, we're here to end hatred. Because what has happened since the um, the initial terrorist attack and now the war that's that's um, happening in Gaza is that it has pitted people against each other, and so what we're trying to promote is people, not politics. We need to make sure that we can put an end to anti-Semitism, an end to racism, an end to prejudice, because we want to make sure that. No matter who you are, you can exist. Mm -hmm. That if you're walking wide black, you're not going to be attacked for being an African American or, or a black appearing person in America. If you want to wear your Star of David, you won't be harassed for wearing your Star of David. If you are wearing hijab or you um, look like you might be from Palestine, uh, uh, Palestinian, or from other parts of the world, you won't be harassed. The terrorist attack and the war mm -hmm. demonstrated how hateful Americans can be against each other. Because I mean? we want to make sure that we can advocate for, for peace. And, and that's a critical thing. And that's why we stood in solidarity when we had the march for Israel against anti-Semitism and to bring the hostages home, we stood in solidarity because we have to end hate and we have to lean into love, understanding, and listening to each other. So you you yourself have become a very vocal ally, a vocal ally, like co-write, I know you co-wrote uh, a letter with Shishiva University uh, president, mm -hmm. uh, and I'll tell us about forming a coalition with some of the other universities that. Yeah, that was, when that terrorist attack happened, it, it hurt everyone's sense of safety, right? And how as college presidents, do we condemn hate and how do we help our 
communities to feel safer. And we knew that we needed to do so in coalition that we shouldn't stand alone. And that how do we how do we show our students that no matter who you are, that we're going to advocate to create spaces for you to feel safer. Mm -hmm. And no matter what type of university, we have to stand in solidarity to end hate. We have to stand in solidarity to help our students lean into brave spaces. And that's one of the things that we're really advocating for right now in America is brave spaces because we can't promise safety because our mere existence might make it unsafe. And so the importance of all of us working collectively to stand up against hate because we do not want our students, whether they're black Jewish students, whether they are students from, you know, who are Palestinian, whether they are students who are, you know, conservative Jewish people or, you know, Jewish by ethnicity, but aren't practicing the faith. We want everyone to be able to, to strive for healthier and safer and more innovation, like, and not be peer pointed mm -hmm. against each other. So do you, you, you personally helped reach out to over a hundred universities, I guess a hundred universities signed this? Yeah. Agreement. So we reached out to the various communities that we were in. Um, so one was we reached out to, for, for me as a member of the African-American um, community, we reached out to other UNCF schools and asked them to consider participating in it. We reached out to the Council of Independent Colleges. We reached out to religious affiliated universities. We reached out to a host of research universities um, to say, let's join together. We have to mm -hmm. condemn any form of terrorism and we have to work towards ending hate. And yeah. and I think that when you're in coalition together, you're mm -hmm. also not standing alone, right? Yeah. And that's what Dillard is trying to do is bring a coalition together of voices to talk about how do we, going back to the purpose of the Senate, how do we create spaces for dialogue, for learning, and for mutual understanding? And we have to do that in coalition. This is so important because I think so many Jews have felt alone, like they're standing alone since October 7th. So and, and that's one of the hard things is that we can love people and hate politics. How many mm -hmm. times I, as an American, have traveled abroad and America has done something really, really horrible? Because unfortunately, America does do things that can be quite embarrassing. But I don't want people to hate me as a person I have to do the same thing with Jewish people. We have to recognize that there's diversity within Jewish people. And just because the state of Israel is doing something doesn't mean that all Jewish people are responsible for that thing. Just like I am not responsible with the American government decides to do on any given day. But what we can do is that we can love Jewish people and advocate that they should be able to exist in America free from hate. And that's the end to anti, that's what we have to, to make sure that we end anti-Semitism. And it's the same thing for, for Black people. We need Jewish people to continue to stand in solidarity of people of color, which might mean your own, you know, Black Jewish people, but it also might mean someone who is Palestinian because of the color of their skin, they are called Black in America, <laughs> Right. It's about standing in solidarity. And when we're weak, that we stand up and we still say, I am here for you, that we're going to work together to ensure we put an end to hate. So is it possible for one to be anti-Hamas and pro-Palestinian and pro-Israeli, Israel at the same time? Are they mutually exclusive? No, because you can be pro-love. People have the right to exist. The state of Israel has the right to exist. People of Pal uh, people who are Palestinian have the right to advocate for their freedoms. 
and to advocate for an end to prejudice that they may see is occurring in the same way that African Americans and Jewish Americans could advocate for ending anti-Semitism and ending racism in America, and we can still be pro-America. And I think that that is, that is a key thing is that we can stand for people, for love, simultaneously, no matter where people find themselves in the world. Well, why do you think so many, you know, people, and I'm going to include in that group of people, a number of college presidents really have had such a hard time with this? Because we live in a soundbite world. We have to lean into people condemning all forms of hate. Anti-Semitism is wrong, but so is Islamophobia. It's wrong. We can't call for the genocide of anybody. That's wrong. What we have to call for is loving people and ending hate. And that's the key thing. And how you learn to love is you have to learn to understand people who are different than you. And creating those environments and those spaces for real dialogue is what we're called to do. And that is not a soundbite. That is taking the time to listen with humility, to recognize what we don't know and what we don't understand, and takes us a time to try to create these brave spaces, spaces for dialogue, spaces for learning, spaces for mutual understanding. And that takes time and that is not a soundbite. But the sound, if you're going to use a soundbite, it's about loving people. It's about people, not politics. Well, I guess, you know, I'm just curious, what are students at Dillard talking about? I mean, obviously you have students who have all sorts of different opinions on the matter, mm -hmm. and especially since October 7th. So can you give us a little bit of a sense of, and I'm not picking, I mean, Dillard being representative of any college really, but what, what have you found? What I have found is that students want to learn, they want to understand, but they also wrestle with being inside these this 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 um, polarization that social media has caused, and so what we do at Dillard is how do we cultivate leaders? And what we say is cultivate leaders who live ethically. So students have to understand what does ethical living mean. And in our mind, ethical living it begins with thinking critically. And you can't think critically unless you start to study and you broaden what you're exposed to. And so we as faculty and staff at Dillard are helping our students to think critically and how to open up and listen to news information that might even at times or resources that might even make them feel uncomfortable at times, mm -hmm. right? And think critically about it. How do you contextualize things? That's that critical thinking, understanding history, and understand that history is told from a whole host of different perspectives. So that critical thinking is how we cultivate leaders. And then we talk about communicating precisely. It begins with listening, because too often we want to communicate. We want to just speak our perspectives. But if we're going to communicate precisely, it begins with listening. And that's what we're trying to do in our attempt to cultivate leaders. And then here's the other thing is how do we teach people to act courageously? And acting courageously might mean standing on a stage like I did and told everyone to pause and remember all of those lies are being lost. Palestinians as well as Israeli lies are being lost in the war that's ensuing. And how do we lean into love? How do we lean into ending hate and anti -tempism? So acting courageously might mean sitting down, listening to people who are very, very different than you are. That's creating that brave space. So our students, when they come to Dillard, they're buying into that vision that they're going to be cultivated as a leader. And sometimes it's going to be uncomfortable. You're going to read something that makes you uncomfortable, that goes against or challenges you from a way that you might have been raised or what you were exposed to. But then it's a learning journey that's going to cultivate them into a leader. So that's what they're signing up for when they come to Dillard is that they're going to be cultivated as a leader. Idea that 
people can be, students can be uncomfortable is a very important one. And not everybody agrees with that today, apparently. It's a challenge. That's a, that's a challenge that society is facing. But the only way that we can lean into love, the only way that we can end hate is that we start learning about each other. And that we have to understand where does the pain come from? And we don't attack people when they're down. Like when, when Black Lives Matter is going, it was hurtful when people said, well, all lives matter. Well, yeah, but my house is on fire. Are you going to pour water and save somebody else's house and not help me put out my fire? And I think it's the same thing when when um, when the, the terrorist attack happened in Israel. Well, we don't want to say, oh, but look over here is burning too. It's like, no, Jewish people are scared. So how do we say, let's help you feel safer? Yes, we're going to learn, but we're also going to say, we see you and we see your pain. And so it's all about showing empathy. So that's the leaning into people, not politics. I can't control what the Israel government's going to do. I can't control what America's going to do. But what I can do is create a space for dialogue. So we lean into the people. So how can we bring this national um, is a really important question even beyond campuses. I mean, I often, I feel like, you know, it's not like the dialogue between the Black, American Black and the American Jewish communities is completely broken because it's not. I think that's a misperception. But I feel like um, it's, but that misperception is really dangerous in itself. Mm -hmm. But what can we do here nationally to, to strengthen this dialogue out beyond campus? Sure. So again, it's about the coalition building. So we take resources that, um, that the ADL provides and how do we use that, not just on college campuses, but how do we use those materials also with community groups, with school districts, with churches and synagogues working together or mosques and synagogues working together or mosques and churches working together? How do we use resources that already exist? How do we take the resources that Brandeis is, is, is developing and bring that out? How do we take the resources like the Spill the Honey that they're you know, developing and bring that out? How do we take the resources that others have been using over the years and share that? And so in year one of the center, it's about building that coalition and creating the framework so that we can create that space for dialogue and for learning. And although we're starting locally, because, you know, it's not even been a whole year since we announced that, that we were going to do this and formed our committee, but how do we also invest in this? Because when you're building coalitions, it does take investment. And what we are daring to do is to create those spaces. And how do we help use our resources to pull together in the Black community, in the Jewish communities, and I have to say communities because there's not a monolithic Black people and there's not monolithic Jewish people. So how do we take these resources and make them available and to create these spaces? And that takes investment of time, it takes an investment of talent, and it also takes investment of treasure. And not that we're trying to take anything away from, you know, Black Lives Matter or from people who want to support, you know, um, you know, Israel in, in, the, in the time, but it does take bringing resources in together to build this, this, this movement and this momentum. Yes. And I think something so important is that empathy really is, does counter polarization. Mm -hmm. So it's like we have to all embark now on a, a national empathy building project. Um, it's true. It, so it, it, it sounds so simple. And it, the concept is simple, but it takes moving past social media where you have a TikTok that can be no more than what? A minute long. And most people won't get through a minute. They'll get to 15 seconds. We have to get past an Instagram post. We have to get past whatever you call it, a tweet or X. I don't know what we call it now, but we have to get past a post. Thank you. We have to get past 
these little soundbite messages that are out there to move into real dialogue. And that takes each of us making an co individual commitment. That's where the ripples happen. I'm going to read something I ordinarily wouldn't have read. I'm going to attend an event that I ordinarily would, have, would not have attended. I'm going to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. I'm going to recognize what I don't know mm -hmm. and lean in and listen. And that's, that's hard work. Back to Dr. King, because we are celebrating him today. Mm -hmm. What would he think of the opening the center, of relaunching the center? I think that he would feel it's critical. Dr. King, it wasn't just about dismantling segregation. Yeah, that was a part of it, but it was about creating social justice in America. And social justice means that each of us have an opportunity to thrive. And when one person is in pain, others are in pain. And so moving together in a coalition that will work and create dialogues and learning and mutual understandings between our communities so that we will understand our shared history and culture, but also work collectively to promote understanding, to promote acceptance, to combat prejudice and discrimination. Like, I think Dr. King would be excited that we are continuing in this work. Thank you. Um, and on that note, we do need to wrap up. I want to thank Dr. Ford and Nadine for joining us today. As a reminder, I've put a link in the chat to the National Center for Black Jewish Relations at Dillard University. Uh, again, thank you everybody for joining us and you can visit momentmag.com to sign up for future programs. Thank you.